I'm Laurie Taylor. I used to be a professor of sociology at the University of York. Uh, I'm now a fellow of Birkbeck College and a radio broadcaster on Radio 4's Thinking Aloud. Well, for me, um, ethnography really means the long-term, detailed, involved observation of particular groups or particular cultures. And what ethnography does is to restore or to bestow meaning upon groups that might previously not be thought to have any meaning, who might be pathologized, regarded as really the scum of the earth or the lowest of the low, or people whose behavior makes no sense whatsoever. But a good ethnographer goes to this group and comes back with news that they all live meaningful and in most cases completely rational lives according to their own rights. It provides an understanding, another perspective, a view into another culture. Of course, way back we all knew that anthropology did this to a great extent in all sorts of other cultures around the world. We're totally familiar with the Trobrian Islands and what went on in Samoa, thanks to Margaret Mead and others. But of course, this in sociology, it tends to be the application of some of those methods used by those famous anthropologists to domestic, to industrial, to urban landscapes, to contemporary cultural formations, rather than those which belong to relatively exotic cultures or faraway cultures. After, after I'd done some work with Stan Cohen in Durham prison, and we wrote a book called Psychological Survival, which was a story of about how these men in the maximum security wing who were faced with sentences of 25 or 30 years inside so we spent some time studying these rather well-known criminals who were banged up in the maximum security wing of Durham prison. And one particular person, John McVicker, who was variously known in the tabloids as the most dangerous man in Britain, was one of our best informants when we were there. He was very, very lucid. He went on to get a very good degree in sociology. Um, when he came out of prison, I thought something needed to be done to help him, perhaps to acquire some money, to get a decent job, not an easiest thing. So I suggested to him, why don't we, John, do a study of professional criminals? Because the only study of professional criminals which had ever been done before, mostly, I think almost without exception, had been studies of people who were in prison who'd been professional criminals. Well, by definition, these people were unsuccessful professional criminals. And when John had spoken to me ever before about the people he hung around with, the villains that he knew of various sorts, I suddenly realised, of course, these were successful working villains. Would he be so kind as to perhaps introduce me to them? Could we hang around with them, go to their clubs, meet them, see something of what they did? And he was initially pretty unwilling to do this. Because although he felt that he had moved himself away out of this criminal community, out of their culture, out of their mores, out of their way of life, out of their jokes, although he'd left behind a culture which had been really very solid and meaningful to him and one that he'd enjoyed and loved, his anarchic spirit had really been exemplified by many of the people who were in this professional criminal undertaking. So he didn't want to sell them out, so he very reluctantly agreed. I can remember it was a classic example, really. Classic example was the first person he wanted to introduce me to, he agreed to introduce me to, was a man, let's call him, uh, let's call him Jeff, who was a confidence trickster, who for many, many years, 30, 40 years, had been making a very, very good living out of defrauding banks in various ways. I mean, I remember turning to him and saying, right, Jeff, can you tell me when you first got started on working on this uh, bank jobs and he said to me Laurie Laurie said that's a that's a question I said oh well, yes yes I've got the tape recorder on I was already I had a whole sheet of questions I said yeah he said, I, I, I said I don't do questions Laurie I said well I, I, no I don't do questions he said no 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 he said nothing to say nothing to say write down the sheet write down the sheet yes go down the station que don't do questions nobody question I suddenly realised that one of the marks of this culture, this subculture, was nobody asked questions. I mean, they associated being asked questions with being investigated. And of course, when I went along to clubs and met many more so-called professional criminals, villains, whatever you want to call them, 
I realized none of them ever asked each other questions. No one said, where have you been lately? Or what were you doing last night? Or I mean, people could disappear for five years, but when they came back after five years away, nobody said, what have you been doing for the last five years? No questions. That was the culture. So that was my introduction. I suddenly realized one thing an ethnographer has to learn, apart from someone who usually issues questions and does surveys, is there are times when it's totally inappropriate to use a question as a way of extracting any information. Ethnography is a very good way of introducing people to sociology because to an extent everybody is already something of an ethnographer. Most people can give a reasonable description of what goes on in their local pub or what goes on in their local gymnasium or what goes on in their local supermarket. Most people have an observational capacity. Now this is a nice way to talk to students because you say to them, look, you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to be a specialist, you just have to be taking an interest in that which is around you, and then you're well on your way to becoming a sociologist, you're well on your way to becoming an ethnographer. And then, once you've done that, then you can gradually introduce them to rather more sophisticated pieces of ethnography. And then, when you've done that, you can begin to introduce them, of course, to theoretical accounts, because you can say, look, we have several accounts here of the way in which gangs flourish. We've got Thrasher's story of the gang. We've got Cloud and Olin's story of the gangs that operate. We've got Albert Cohen's story of the way in which gangs operate. We've got all these various... We've got William White's story of how gangs operate. What is the disagreement? What is going on here? And then you can begin to introduce theory by saying, look, what Albert Cohen is doing when he's talking about delinquent boys that he's observed, when his piece of ethnography is looking at, he is using a Freudian account. He's got a Freudian mechanism to explain why a great deal of the behaviour of these young people is malicious, negativistic and non-utilitarian. But if we move over here, we see another theory, Cloud and Olin, called opportunity structure theory, where they say one of the main determinants of whether you commit crime or not depends upon the nature of the environment in which you grow up. Some people grow up in an environment where the opportunity to become a professional criminal isn't there. There are no apprenticeships available. This is such a disordered, violent area. You can't become a professional criminal. So gradually, moving from the detail, the particular, the sense of locality, outwards towards theoretical accounts. So you can say, these are ethnographies. They're all ethnographies of the gang, but they differ. They are all theoretically different. They are all based upon slightly different assumptions. They use the data they've got to confirm slightly different theories. Then all of a sudden, theory doesn't seem such a terrible thing. There's, of course, there's a great deal that social scientists know which isn't generally and freely available to other people. There are there is a lot of stuff there which needs to be put out into the world where people need to find ways to introduce people to it. So we don't want to think of sociology as something which simply goes on in the academy. As long as it remains an academy subject, then people are still likely to back away from it in the way they back away from you know, They feel they're disqualified somehow. You know, They feel, well, I'm not a geographer, so how can I comment upon the way in which this river interrelates with the landscape? So I think... We have a duty as sociologists, and Foucault used to say this, to undermine the academic teaching of sociology at the same time as we promote social science. You know, we must be careful not to believe that something called social science only resides in universities and in degree structures. We must be aware that people attempting to resolve questions raised by the way we live and live together and tolerate and manage are all around us. That is social science going on, and we must be careful not to make sociology a club which only some people can enter and only some people can practice. Sometimes we may have to put up with the fact that there are too many amateur sociologists around and we wish they knew a bit more and didn't put their vapid opinions on the television, on the radio so regularly. But they're all increasing the appetite. And I listen to the Today programme in the morning, one third of the items are really social science items. When I look at the television at night, I can say, good heavens, this is, here we are, another social science item. What's social science got to say about this? It is, it is everywhere. And one of the things that we can do is relax a little bit, not count the number of members of the British Sociological Association all the time as a firm index of the popularity of sociology, 
but as it were, look at all the manifestations, all the inquiries and questioning about the nature of the world which go on around us. That is sociology in everyday life.